Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have one of our longer term consulting client partners, Kristen and Heidi. Um, they have an amazing home birth practice in New York. Deidre and I have been helping them and it's just amazing to see the transition from the practice opening to where they're at. Um, one of the things Heidi just recently joined with Kristen and I really wanted Heidi to expand on what is it like for a nurse midwife that's got experience in the hospital world to jump into the community world? It's particularly like business and newborn care and those those really independent autonomy things that we're just not used to in the hospital world. So thank you both for being here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I think the biggest difference I have noticed is the autonomy. Um, when, when I was working in a hospital, there was a guideline for a guideline for a guideline in order to do any practice of midwifery. So you, you had to adhere to those guidelines constantly um, and they weren't usually midwifery friendly. They were, um, and they were decided by some, you know, committee of eight people um, that some midwives were uh, at the table but weren't listened to. Um, Cause you know, we keep promoting saying you gotta be at the table, you gotta be at the table to make these decisions but that doesn't really matter even when you're at the table. <laughs> I mean, that was a hard lesson to learn in the hospital. Um, and it's really nice to honestly have control over how I practice, who I have in the practice, um, and even being able to take care of babies again. Like you don't take care of babies in a hospital, you know, you, you just don't. There's a pediatrician telling you everything, you have no control over that, you know, and all these babies are being supplemented and blood sugars and all these terrible things you're watching these babies go through. So their transition to this world is really, traumatic yeah. um so like that's you really can, you can um do what makes sense as opposed to yeah doing what the the, the flow piece of paper says, says yeah do. like the flow yeah. sheet yeah exactly um and I'm able to like personalize it for each family you know where it's like you don't have to just do like a it's not a cookie cutter thing anyway with birth but um I think the autonomy can be scary as well for some people. I mean, I, I had uh, nearly five years of experience in the hospital and I had some home birth experience already as a doula before I joined this home birth practice. So I was already exposed to community hospital or community birth. Um, I can see somebody in the hospital feeling like, oh my God, what do I do? And I'm like, here's the deal. Birth doesn't change. Birth is the same. Um, if anything, it's just better because like, you know, primates don't labor for two or three days you know mm. like <laughs> no inductions no high risk we joke not, all those right. ladies that come in squeezing cheeks that are super natural doing their thing that's what you get all the time yeah <laughs> exactly mm. like when you're waiting for that one cool birth to come to like reinvigorate you for your midwife cup um it happens every single time and yeah i mean of course there's struggle you don't have that big team behind you um when you're in the home but you don't need it you know like when you think about um I had this obstetrician once uh, that I knew I was transitioning to home birth and, and we had a non-competitive type of situation at the hospital I was working at. And um, we had a particularly difficult birth and the baby's heart tones were dropping and um, I was getting scared and I usually don't get scared, you know, but um, she stood next to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she goes, I just want you to remember that this is what I would tell you if you were sitting at home, like everything's going to be okay. You know, she's like, just imagine me putting my hand on your shoulder and saying everything's going to be okay. Um, and I've had that one time so far <laughs> where I'm like envisioning her do that, you know, where it's like Aww. you have to kind of come up with other ways of um, what is your next person that you can talk to. I have Kristen, obviously. So mm -hmm. like I can call her anytime, which is phenomenal. You don't do that with in the hospital either with your partners in the midwife world. Like if you call your midwife who's off call, they'd be like, why are you calling me? This is mm. not what you do, you know, where I have that relationship with Kristen, where I can call her anytime, honestly, especially yeah. if I'm nervous about anything. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, and I think part of it is um, you get fearful of what you don't know and you don't understand. There's a lot of myths and misunderstandings and people have a comfort level of a call light where there's a bunch mm -hmm. of people in the room and you have two people like your assessment skills have to be really, really sharp. And cause you're making mm -hmm. all the decisions. Do we need to transfer? Um, mm -hmm. Do we need to go in? How long does EMS take? What, what's the bigger story? But you also have the advantage of you've known these ladies the entire time versus you've mm -hmm. met her for the first time. And now you're waiting for records to come in a chart. Like you have digging through tons of paper, hoping you don't miss anything. You know, their children, mm -hmm. you know, their story. When they call you in labor, you have such a level of assessment that the average midwife in the hospital doesn't get to know these ladies well and when right. you work in a hospital you press that call late yeah eight people run in but two people really do all the work 
Where that happens, right? So like, chaos. it just adds chaos, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Where it's like, when I, I haven't, we have a nurse that comes with us to all of our births and she's trained in NRP and she does IV stuff. Like she, she we balance each other out, you know, where yeah. it's like, you have better control honestly where it, like you, it can stay calm you know like I had a situation you're also working with the same people all the time all the time so you get really connected um, yeah like it's almost like those wink wink I you know you don't have to even verbally little cues. yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah but like um we had a baby the other day who just came super fast and was shocked and didn't want to breathe and it was like the first time I've had to do breaths with a baby um and it was really smooth and it was calm Mm-hmm. It wasn't like freak the mom out and freak the dad out. It was like completely relaxed and, and we handled it fine, yep. you know? So it's like, I, I remind myself that we have the same tools in the home that we have in a labor room. Mm-hmm. The only thing we don't have is a surgical suite. And I, I would, I would challenge any midwife who's ever worked in OB. Um, when's the fastest C-section you've had, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I have had very fast C-sections because I worked at a unit where it could be seven minutes. Like that literally could be that, but that's not heard that's of. Not the it's unheard of everywhere else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's usually a 45 minutes to an hour before you actually have a C-section. So like, mm-hmm. that's plenty of time to get to a hospital. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's this misnomer that you have this safety net that you don't really have. I mean, it's, it's literally a misunderstanding. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, and a lot of it is people are thinking of, oh my gosh, this lady came in on drugs and cocaine and all this stuff and all this crap we had to do to her. And I'm like, we have low risk, healthy ladies. You have to separate everything you, you see in the hospital to the mm-hmm. low risk, healthy ladies that just come in. We're not inducing them. Mm-hmm. They don't have hypertension and all these complexities that do cause mm-hmm. a lot of the risk. Like even if you are doing NRP, you're keeping the cord intact. The mom's mm-hmm. holding the baby. You usually right. do a little puffs of PPV. We reinforce mm-hmm. to give a little breathing carbon dioxide in front of the baby and it's calm like we get to determine the anxiety and stress level in the room and get to have but you also have to if you don't if you've never resuscitated a baby in your life you never did labor and delivery you never did in the hospital you need to get the training you need to do like Mm -hmm, home birth academy and some of these amazing resources or find a home birth midwife in the area to mentor you you know what you're you've done and your competencies and you have to fill in the gaps so um, i guess if you have some examples heidi of what were the biggest things you noticed of maybe newborn care because i know that's a lot of the anxiety we're taught it in school and a lot of times the five you have to get signed off or the postpartum nurse going in the mm-hmm. nursery and just doing a normal versus you're taking care of them the whole first month kind of talk about that mm-hmm. more so I am unique in that because I was a pediatric nurse as well ah. so mm-hmm. I I was not Did uncomfortable with that at all comfort? I had such a level of comfort. Like I am probably the opposite of that where I'm like, I don't resuscitate unless I absolutely need to, you know, like there's very much like I have seen babies work really hard to live many, many times. So, um, however, I, so I found it as like, nice. I liked the fact that I have seen things go wrong all the time in the hospital, being a pediatrics nurse, where I had to take care of babies who were under Billy lights. And I had to take care of growers and feeders that, you know, were failure to thrive at home and they would get admitted. Um, that doesn't happen in home birth right? Like, yes, we evaluate for jaundice, but, um, you know, how often we actually have to do anything with a jaundice baby is super rare, you know, like it's We're watching so much more closely and yeah, breastfeeding support. support so much better. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. The yep. preventive side is so strong that a lot of these complications people see, they don't realize because of the system did it versus the actual disease. Process. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's the right. guideline. Right. It's the stupid guidelines, those yeah. blood sugar guidelines and the jaundice guidelines, all those things that like, you know, treat the many for the few, you know, where it's like, you don't have that in home birth. And like, we are picking, you know, obviously having, you have guidelines at home birth. I mean, it's not like we don't do that. Um, Like Chris and I sat down and we came up with like, what are we comfortable with? Like, what is, what is our version of low risk, right? Like you don't have to go by ACNM because ACNM doesn't really give you much guidance on that. Um, However, we can sit down and go, okay, there's, there's this, like, for example, there's a lot of groups that wouldn't do breech birth. We mm-hmm. want to do breech birth because it's something really that we're both very passionate about. That mm-hmm. would never even be an option for me in a hospital. I remember when I was leaving, there was a woman on her third baby who precips and um, she had a breech baby that re- that reverted. And then she was um, um, did another ECV and it, and it didn't work, but then she went into labor and she has babies in an hour and mm-hmm. she starts laboring. And I'm in the hospital knowing I was moving here to New York to go to home birth. And, um, 
she was rushed off to the surgery suite when she was like nine centimeters to have the C-section. Mm -hmm. Pushing the baby want. up, holding it in. Yeah, they do that for yes. backs all the time. Like, just yes, because like, it's not out. safe. Because <laughs> it's not safe, right? Like this woman had hour long labors with two other babies and she pushed for two minutes, you know, like she the easily could have had. Out. Yes. The baby's gonna and it out. was like just another thing for me to be like, we can offer something different at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that like, and that might not be everyone's, you know, cup of tea, but like for us, that's what we chose, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like, and, and it's interesting because like with hypertension, that's a, an interesting one to talk about because, you know, that's also very different. Every hospital you work in, how mm -hmm. they handle hypertensive patients. Lately, the trend has been that the hospitals are making midwives be the grunt work of everything. So you're having preeclampsic, you're having, you know, cardiac issues. You're, you're basically managing obstetrician high patients. Risk. Yeah. You're the high risk the all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. Right. So like in most midwives I talk to, they're not comfortable with that. I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Um, and then now here, this is actually what we're trained to do, right? Like home birth is what we're actually trained to do. So it's like, Oh, low risk people, like you can trust that, mm -hmm. right? Like you have thousands of years of trust. You're right. Mm -hmm. Where you're like, okay, women have been doing this for thousands of years, right? Like, yeah, we know what to look for. That's wrong. We've all been trained in that. Mm -hmm. And we transfer when we need to, but the transfer rate's so low that because we're taking care of them, you know, and we're watching them, it's one-on-one -on -one care. Who does that? Yeah. Who has yeah, a you get the Cadillac of care. I stress to people all the time. Yeah. Like, we're not going to miss things. That labor and delivery nurse is going to have multiple people, the providers yep. in, the, uh, in the call room. They're not watching the strip. They're not keeping an eye. Like you're getting the best of best and you're going to catch things. You're going to catch things quick. You're going to catch little subtle things. You know that client really, really well. Like, okay, mm -hmm. she's like all of a sudden profusely sweating and she was just totally fine. Like you're not going right. to catch that unless you're doing one-on-one. -on -one. So you, you, there's so many benefits. Mm -hmm. One of the births Kristen and I did when we first got here, like I caught a, a, a late that was like an obvious one of those flat scary lates that you never see mm -hmm. but like continuously right and I was like that doesn't sound right you know like that's mm -hmm. not that's not right right we have an external fetal monitor that we we can use just as an NST so I ran to the clinic and we got the NST and we hooked her up and sure as heck it was that scary it was that yeah. scary mm -hmm. one that you never see but you know you see once or twice in your lifetime lates. yeah flat and repetitive lates <laughs> and we rushed her to the hospital you know and she had her baby and the after it was what, like two and seven or something it wasn't great but the baby came around but the baby came okay. around right but they're like, resilient they're they're meant yeah, to exactly. go through some tough but stuff like yeah. that i think is what a lot of midwives are scared of is that ultimate that thing happening at home how do we handle it is like, it safe you go to the hospital right <laughs> like and that reinforced for me like oh even if this happened in the labor room same thing would have happened right mm -hmm. like she literally got an, a c-section in the same amount of time mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like it was like worst case scenario for me where i'm like oh here's this baby who's like not doing great on the monitor and what would we do for her at home oh we transfer them right like it was just a, a reinforcement that it is safe for me yeah. Well, and part of the other thing that hit me when I did my clinical rotation for the Amish Mennonites, I was a labor and delivery nurse for a long time and I wanted a home birth birth center because I knew that's what I wanted to do, but I never got exposed besides doing a few birth assisting for the midwife that I eventually went to. But like the laundry stuff, like, oh, you're so spoiled where you just throw everything in the hospital to clean up and mm -hmm. like, you've got to be a little more conscientious because it's your mm -hmm. mess and it's your supplies and it's your, if if you didn't bring what you needed with you, you can't just go down the hallway to the supply room. So if you want right. to talk about that accountability stance of like all these extra things we take advantage of in the hospital that you're now responsible for. Well, yeah, but like we make the, the client responsible for a lot of it, you know, so it's like we have a list. Honestly, now I put pictures for, on for the list. Yeah, like like having like a that. strainer, you know, yeah, like I had to, bowl, yeah, yeah, for the birth bowl, like little mm -hmm. things where it's like just have enough towels and, you know, and we have mm -hmm. a specialized birth kit for right. them to purchase that we sometimes will reimburse for. But but I do feel like we are much more conscientious about maintaining mm -hmm. their space as their space mm -hmm. and not being the, you know, I've seen midwives and OBs, you know, take off their dirty gloves and throw them on the floor, even though there's the a garbage, garbage right can next is to them. right there. Yeah. Like just put garbage. Why do you mm -hmm. not care yeah. about who's cleaning up after you? Whereas like, we obviously care that this is yeah. someone's home. Yeah. You know, we want to mm -hmm. keep it clean and leave it like their home. Well, well and, and you brought up, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's okay. It's just it, it, when you think about, I think that was one of the things I thought about coming out of the hospital. <laughs> that sounds so stupid, but it was the mess, right? Like mm -hmm. 
how much of it am I going to have to clean up? What, what am I going to have to do? And it's so minimal. I mean, like Chuck's mm -hmm. pads are the same at home as in the hospital. So like, yeah. really, it's not that much. Um, and these parents are committed to having a home birth. So like, they're asking, like, what can I do to have it ready? Dads are like involved. Dads mm -hmm. are involved. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think people are, are partners, I should say, even mm -hmm. are involved. Right. Whereas like they're not sitting watching TV or um, mm -hmm. doing Xbox or mm -hmm. right. Like they're super involved. So it, it's it's and they're at their comfort level. Right. Like mm -hmm. so they you know, you're not the only one cleaning up. But at the same point, you're you're trying to clean up for them. Right. And they're like, don't do it. Don't do it. And they're like right. making we'll, you we'll breakfast. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They want to pamper you. They love their midwives. They and do. it's just a different relationship because you're a guest in their house. They can lock the door. Like if you go to the hospital, this is your turf. Like there's a different mm -hmm. level of autonomy. Mm -hmm. Like and that's the way it should be. They should have full access of rights and decision making. And it makes a difference in the two settings. Like I would see so much extra complication happen even though I was the same midwife as soon as we did it in the hospital there's extra algorithms there's extra mm -hmm. fear there's extra mm -hmm. cultural influences that you can take away in the home setting well and mm -hmm. I also think it's interesting one of the things I was worried about coming to home birth and I talked to Kristen about this because when I was a doula I worked for very white middle class women Mm -hmm. And because they could afford it, this is, you know, 25 years ago, right? So they could afford a doula. And, and I am very passionate about serving like Medicaid patients. Um, so I talked to Chris, I was like, oh, that's part of my apprehension of going into home birth again, is mm -hmm. that I don't want to serve white middle class women, I'd rather only. serve only right like we only like, we still serve white middle, against class women. white middle class right women. but like not but not but it tends to be the ones because in a lot of the midwife practices across the country if you're looking at the stereotype stigmas they're cash and very few do insurance so who can mm -hmm. afford the cash side versus how you guys have set up your business structure that many midwives just right. don't know that's an option mm -hmm. exactly yeah. so that's what i that's what was the biggest benefit is knowing that we can serve Medicaid patients and like yeah, and bill, is, billing's a thing because well. we use because we mm -hmm. use you guys honestly oh, right. that like we learned that we can do that um, but now we're serving everybody I feel like birth is a baseline for the community right so like we have people who are Republican to Democrat religious to not religious like people that vax people that don't vax like every and it doesn't matter because we we've, we've based our business on informed consent so like whatever you're deciding to do with your baby and your birth and your body, that's what you do. And we mm -hmm. support it. You know, mm -hmm. that's what we didn't see in a hospital ever, right. ever. It was always like, you have to do what we told you to do. And I felt like I was contributing to trauma mm -hmm. over and over. And it was breaking my heart every single day because it was like, and, I, and that's what Kristen and I, we went to school together and I would call her when I had these horrible times and be like, this is what happened. And like, mm -hmm. it, I can't even handle it anymore. Like I was going to quit midwifery at that point. It was like, I can't even keep doing this. It was so heartbreaking. Um, all the systems that are in place at a hospital are meant to protect the system, not you. Mm -hmm. So it was very much like, I was not appreciated or needed and I was replaceable and my voice didn't matter here. It, that is complete opposite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in regards to the being able to serve Medicaid patients too, like there's actually no other community midwives in our area who don't charge people some amount of out of pocket expense, non covered services for certain things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we don't. We're, yeah. I know we're the only practice locally that is getting full reimbursement from, from Medicaid. Yeah. Um, it makes well, a it, difference it, your billing company and your resources versus you're trying to yeah. do it. And like a lot of midwives just don't know how to play that billing game. Mm hmm. Well, and that's the thing is that like, we're not in network, we do out of network agreements. So we don't, so I want, don't want people to under, to misconstrue this is that we're not getting paid the Medicaid pay, pay, bill. Yes, Medicaid that's pays really pay important to stress. Yes. Yeah. You're not getting paid right? the like, terrible Medicaid. We're not getting paid the yes. $1,200 or some stupid thing that Medicaid decides yeah. that midwives are worth for birth. Um, it's, it's a agreement that uh, it's basically like a, how a hospital does uh, where they mm -hmm. do an out of network agreement. Um, so we're getting way more than that, but it's, it was it makes it functional and, and, and I think, okay, coming from a hospital, you, you're worried one about malpractice. How do you have to pay for that? Mm -hmm. Um, you're worried also about the resources that you're going to get, you know, like I went from a place that had a pension to not that, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so Benefits, like, yeah. 
-hmm. you know, like the benefits are much less, um, you know, I, but I remember even having all these benefits. I didn't even know how to utilize in the hospital, you know, like, he's like, sure. Yes, 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 yes. I'll agree to all those things. Um, so, but you can create those in the community, you know? So now a lot of those resources that I thought I needed, I mean, I do need, but like Chris and I can do it individually we or mm -hmm. as a group now, instead of like in the hospital. Yeah. So I, I think there, there is more options than people realize going for benefits wise outside of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's part of your budgets. And then you get to decide what health insurance do you want a low deductible? Do you want a high deductible? Do you want mm -hmm. this insurance company? You get to meet one-on-one -on -one with a financial planner versus they just give you the algorithm of the benefit package. And very few people actually meet with the department's benefit officer that mm -hmm. you can. So like, I think people need to, you still want retirement. You still want all the benefits and perks. You want your vacation time counted for. It's just the average midwife doesn't have the business education to know how to accurately make a fee schedule accurately mm -hmm. get the reimbursement needed to cover all those expenses there's a lot mm -hmm. of stigmas well i just have to go without malpractice i just have to go without insurance because i can't make the numbers work mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep 100 yep. so. i mean that's the that's the overwhelming part i think we're like are, we're not we don't have a business degree <laughs> right mm -hmm. but like that's why we hired you guys <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've been beyond excited. The train. I wish we had more and more nurse midwives. Um, I mean, CPMs, they know they're not going to get a job at the hospital. They know they're mm -hmm. either rarely going to go work for someone else. Maybe they're a preceptor or they're going to start a practice. There's just this stigma difference of mindset. They don't get any more business education than nurse midwives do, mm -hmm. but there's a stigma of that security blanket, I think is a hindrance when nurse midwives are like, well, I'll just work at the hospital. Maybe I'll sell my soul, but I got a paycheck and I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about that where CPMs don't have that choice. They just open a mm -hmm. practice and do their thing. So I wish we had more nurse midwives like you guys, where we can really, I mean, you can tell little hints, but you can make more money. And many nurse midwives, when they set up things well, make double, triple, quadruple what they were in the hospital setting with far mm -hmm. less work in their own timeline. So mm -hmm. I think we have to get past a lot of those stigmas and understanding of what running a business can look like versus just the stigma people think a home birth birth center practice looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Agreed. any final words you guys would love to add of words of wisdom or just anything to help if someone's watching this video and thinks, okay, I'm so close, Heidi. If you said this one little thing, it would make me really call up and um, figure out how to start a business. Is there anything that... Um, oh, hire the midwife. Hire <laughs> <laughs> you guys. Hire you guys. Oh, <laughs> you're so sweet. Thank you. No, Dean no, honestly, and I have loved it. Mm -hmm. And it's oh. like, it's obviously you guys have been a huge support for us, but at the same point, like I, I'm a um, relationship human. And, and for me, it's interesting that there's a lot of changes going on in our area. And there's like mm -hmm. other midwives that are reaching out to us that want to start home birth practices. Mm -hmm. And um, I think having that conversation is really, really important mm -hmm. um, because it is, it is the unknown. It's the fear of the unknown. Oh. Um, but we know this stuff. Yeah, we know this stuff. Like we've already been taught this stuff. We've already been doing this stuff. So mm -hmm. it's really not a huge jump. Um, it is and it isn't, you know, like uh, Kristen and I balance each other out, you know, mm -hmm. like there's some things I'm really good at and something she's really good at. And that really helps because um, it makes it so it's not so overwhelming running mm -hmm. a business. I do think yeah. having a partner is pretty important. I do I agree with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of pros and cons to doing the partnership relationship, but yeah, finding that balance. I mean, you just want to surround yourself by people that are going to take you to the next level um, versus are going to th make things more stressful and challenging. You want to complement each other, but you have a core mission. I know we talked about before the recording. Um, if you're thinking of opening a business, it's not so much the money and the budgets are important, but that's more at the end of the business planning process. It's partnering with people that have a core mission and vision and value mm -hmm. aligns with you and where you want to go go that's the most important part when you're looking at starting practices mm -hmm. and then once you find those partners that you know in the beginning and long term you guys are pretty similar alignment yes you're going to have your different beliefs and background experiences but that'll complement the core mission um and then the i mean I, I bragged to you guys before recording i can help midwives break even i can help midwives make multi-millions the numbers on the piece of paper it just depends on how complex they want to make things that's mm -hmm. the easy part to me because i know a lot of the resources and tools and revenue streams the average midwife doesn't. Um, so yeah, I think getting midwives to get out of their own glass ceiling effect of what they 
think a home birth birth center private practice. We have tons of nurse midwives doing telemedicine, doing niche businesses, mm -hmm. doing women's health clinics. If you don't want to be on OB call, you don't have to be on OB call mm -hmm. to start a private mm -hmm. practice. So mm -hmm. I think just getting midwives to be inspired, like I can be a business owner, I can do this, but I've mm -hmm. got to train, I've got to learn. This is why 90% of businesses by year five close is not the business plan. It's usually the person and the lack of education they had in the support. So um, I'm so proud of you guys. I think you've mm -hmm. gone through so many growths and challenges, but Deidre and I um, have loved supporting you guys the last year and a half, two years with uh, opening and your success level. So thank you for your time today. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank, thank you. you.